we each know we each know what it's like to go to a mall or a uh, or an amusement park or a park, and there's a there's some kind of map that's there that uh, that that and it's a big place, and and there's whatever entrance you're walking into wherever you are, there's a little pin on the map that says you are here. Well, th- that's that's helpful because that's intended to help you find where you are in relationship to everything else. Well, that 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 illustration of being able to drop a pin down wherever you are is also helpful when it comes to studying the Bible. It, it's good to be able to drop a pin down and remember where you are in relationship to everything else. So I want to do that just really quick with John chapter 20. Here in John 20, we drop our pin down and we learn this, that we're at the end of the book, there's just a little bit left, and we are with Jesus, soon to be with his disciples, on the first Easter Sunday morning. Just a few hours ago, an angel asked a woman, why do you seek the living among the dead? Just a few days before this, Pilate, the Roman official overseeing the execution of Jesus, whether he wanted to or not, told Roman guards, make that tomb where they put Jesus as secure as possible. Good luck with that. And now, Jesus will prove that he is, yes, alive from the dead by appearing to his disciples over a course of, and he's he's actually going to do this a number of times over a 40-day period before he ascends back to the Father. And he's going to do this in order that we may believe in him and continue to believe in him. So my friends, may today we behold the resurrected Lord from John 20 verses 19 to 31, that's where we'll be, and say with his disciple in this passage, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. Would you stand as we give our attention to this passage? I want you to just follow along as I read. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, starting in verse 19. Just follow as I read. We're going to read down to verse 31. This is the word of God. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to them, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray together and ask for God's help. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for your word. We pray that what we know not, you would teach us. What we have not, you would give us. What we are not, you would make us. And Lord, I, I meant to, I did it in the first service. So I'll do it, uh, do it now here. Lord, I just pray for the call years. I'm so grateful for them, grateful for their willingness to come back and for their, to bring their children from this other culture. Lord, I just pray that you would give Josh and Janice and Grayson and Landon and Kaitlin and Caleb all the grace they need to be faithful to you here. And Lord, would you give us all the grace we need to be faithful? May we supplement our faith with all of the things that Second Peter says we need as we learn that Jesus is, that you, dear Jesus, we can address you. You are alive from the dead. You are alive and well. You are loose and at large, changing lives in this world. And so, Lord, help us to see you and believe in you. In your great name we pray. Amen. Amen, friends. Thank you. Take your seats. You see at the top of your notes the message in a sentence, so that's really what we're trying to get at today. And friends, that is that the appearances of Jesus prove that he is alive from the dead and give us reasons to believe in him. The appearances of Jesus, recorded here and in other places, give us reasons to believe in him 
or excuse me, prove that he is alive from the dead and give us reasons to believe in him. So let's just, let's just stop and remember what is the central claim of Christianity. The, 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 the central claim of Christianity, what, what, makes, what makes this movement expressed through believers and local churches and their leaders different than any worldview, teaching, philosophy, or, other, or any other way of doing life is the claim that the crucified Christ is and always will be the resurrected Christ. This is the claim, that the one who was crucified is now alive, and alive in a very unique sense, as we will see. He's not alive metaphorically. This isn't a metaphor. He's not alive spiritually. He's not alive subjectively in each of his people's hearts as they hope that he would be. He's alive physically. And that is what makes the difference. It's the reason we're here today. It's the reason why any of this makes any sense. And so to quote Jesus himself to this same author in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. That's Jesus now. You see, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and Lazarus died again, poor guy. Jesus died and is alive forevermore. This is what makes Christianity, Christianity. And so, we, in this world that we live in that is increasingly complex, difficult to understand, confusing, and sometimes scary, we are the people of God, which means that we as the people of God affirm what the apostle wrote, that he delivered to us that which is of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, friends, in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter to the rest of the disciples. And he amazingly, within that period of time between his resurrection and ascension, appeared to more than 500 people at one time. Don't believe me, Paul says? Go ask any one of them. And then Paul says he appeared to me, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. This is what we believe. And in this passage, friends, it's very simple. We want to learn that the appearances of Jesus prove that he's alive from the dead and give us reason to believe in him. And we're going to do that by understanding the appearance, the doubt, the proof, and the purpose. That's the message today. First, number one, let's start with the first appearance. The first appearance, verses 19 to 23. Verse 19 says, on the evening of that day, that is the first day of the week, John says. This is Sunday. Okay, this is still, so we're still, remember, let's drop our pen down. We're still on Resurrection Sunday. Okay, the door is being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, so they're scared that what happened to Jesus could also happen to them, so they're in hiding. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Suddenly, as the disciples are hiding for fear of the Jews showing up at any moment, finding their safe house, arresting them, taking them hostage like they did Jesus, putting them through a trial and killing them just like they did their Lord, Jesus comes mysteriously, miraculously, in a way that seems similar to how we are now, but is also incredibly dissimilar. Out of nowhere, he he materializes in their their midst. How is he able to do that? Well, clearly there's something very unique about his post-resurrection body, that locked doors are no problem for him. Clearly, what John is trying to tell us is that this is miraculous and mysterious. That's why he adds the detail, he's gonna say it twice, about the doors being locked in verse 19. In other words, This was a secure environment, and Jesus got in. And he got in because that's what a post-resurrection Jesus does. And when he appears to them in this moment, in verses 19 to 23, friends, I want us to see, and these aren't on your notes, so just do your best to jot them down or just listen. Jesus does four things with his disciples when he appears. He does four things. He calms his disciples. He shows his disciples. He commissions his disciples and he promises his disciples. He does those four things. First, he calms his disciples. Three times in this passage, we see what is in Hebrew, shalom. You see where that would be? Verse 19, peace be with you. Verse 21, he repeats himself, probably because they were startled. Peace be with you. Verse 26, 
Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, that's just a, a Hebrew greeting. It's just shalom. So, I, I, inevitably, Jesus is trying to calm his disciples. This, this Resurrection Sunday is, is a jarring day for the disciples. I'll probably make this point once or twice, but it's very obvious that when you just pull together everything, not just the Gospel of John, but also particularly Matthew and Luke, it just seems very obvious that the disciples stumble their way through hearing the news that Jesus is alive from the dead. They, this is not… <laughs> um, just because they're a pre-modern you know, modern culture with not as much technology doesn't mean it was any more difficult for them to believe that someone came back from the dead. So they're still like, what? Wait, maybe we doubt. I, I, Luke, adds this, Luke, Luke says that, that with joy and with fear, they see the Lord. I mean, it's just this mixture of emotions these men are feeling. So Jesus comes in and he says, peace, peace. I think he says it twice because probably if you're in a room, you're in hiding, Jesus materializes out of nowhere, you're a little shocked. There's probably some shrieks, there's probably some uh, stuff like that. But, on an, but in another way, Jesus isn't just calming them, he's also teaching them. Jesus said, and in, in before his crucifixion, he said, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. So this is gospel peace, isn't it? This is peace of assurance and reconciliation with God achieved by the one who died to make it possible. Second thing Jesus does, he shows his disciples. Look at verse 20. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now this theme is going to develop of Jesus showing himself off, as it were, uh, showing that he is indeed actually who he says he is, and he is physically before their eyes standing there. But, 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 very obvious, but very obvious, when the disciples see this, they, they respond as they should. The end, the end of verse 20, then the disciples were glad when they saw the who? The Lord, the curios, the king, the sovereign, the one with dominion. They see it, they, he says, Jesus comes to them and says, look, look, what happened there? Look here. Because Jesus died in this very unique way. Jesus died very quick. Uh, he died in about a six-hour period. Some people hung on crosses for days if you can imagine the horror. Jesus dies very quick, and so you remember the, the guard takes a spear, Matthew, Matthew and Luke record this, takes a spear, and he shoves it in between his ribcage, and water and blood come out, signifying that he is indeed dead. That's what he's referring to here. So that's a, that's a very unique mark, like, I, I got this. So the disciples are glad when they see the Lord, and of course, that's just going to continue to develop. The third thing Jesus does is he commissions his disciples, and through them, he commissions us. We see this commissioning in verse 21, what can be referred to as John's version of the Great Commission. Peace be with you, he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So as Jesus was sent into the world to bring good news, so we are sent in the world to announce the good news that he achieved. Number four, Jesus promises his disciples. He calms them, he shows them, he commissions them, and then he promises them. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now, that's an interesting verse, isn't it? When Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, he's, he's very clearly uh, enacting what ought to be understood as a, as, as a ceremonial empowerment, as a pledge of power. Because what we know is that the Holy Spirit comes down upon the church officially, forever, never to be repeated in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost. So clearly what Jesus is doing here is giving them a sort of a pledge of that power that is to come. It, it, it's not as if with just the, just, the, just the exhaling of his breath, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. It's intended to be understood as sort of a down payment. Here's what you can expect Here's the peace that will come to you, okay? He does the same thing when he tells them, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you back in chapter 14. Well, that was going to happen at a later date. And so in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church, that funnel is opened, and everyone else after it plugs into that one funnel and receives Holy Spirit power when they trust in Jesus for the very first time. And this power, this promise of it is going to help them on their mission, that's verse 23, this mission of announcing forgiveness. Now, when you just look at verse 23, just hang with me here. It seems as if, at, at first glance, Jesus is, Jesus is saying that it is within the disciples and the church that follows after them the ability to absolve people of their sins or to withhold that absolving of people from their sins, right? If you forgive anyone their sins, verse 23, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. That's clearly not what Jesus means because that would contradict the rest of Scripture. Jesus himself said, no one can forgive sins but God alone. 
A sinner can't forgive another sinner in an absolute way. Only the offended party can do that, and only the person who has achieved the forgiveness can do that. What Jesus must absolutely mean is that insofar as the church has been entrusted with a gospel that announces that through the finished work of Christ, forgiveness is possible, on that basis, we with assurance, whether it's here, whether it's with a neighbor, whether it's with a family member, whether it's with a coworker, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we with assurance can say, if you trust in Jesus, the promise is you will be forgiven of your sins. So in that regard, we can offer forgiveness to other people. We don't have it within ourselves to actually absolve them of their sins, but we can announce the means by which it happens. And in the same way, if Christ is the only way by which we are forgiven of our sins, those people that do not believe in Jesus, there is a sense in which forgiveness is withheld from them, wouldn't it be? And so Jesus is not contradicting himself saying that you and I offer forgiveness that saves. He's simply saying that we have the message that can be announced, and from that perspective, yes, we can arbiter this forgiveness and this unforgiveness as best as we can see it. Now, I went through that quick. There's a lot there. What I want you to see in this first appearance, friends, is the grace of Jesus. Here's what I mean. Jesus shows up in their midst. Now, who, 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 who's, who's Jesus' audience in this first appearance? Scared, betraying, denying scared for their life, don't want to die for Jesus' disciples. And what Jesus doesn't tell Mary is, go get those slackers and tell them I want to see them. <laughs> he goes to them. Peace. That's the character of Jesus. Good news, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Number two. Number two, let's consider second, the doubting disciple, the doubting disciple. Now, we've, we've all been in a situation, probably this most often happens to me at some kind of reception where uh, someone is telling a story about someone else, and it's very clear that if you want to get the most out of this story, you had to be one of the three people that were there. You know, like, you know, I get, you know and the story ends with everyone nervously laughing, and, and then the guy saying, I guess you had to be there, Okay. Man, sorry you got left out of that. Well, I, I would imagine that verses 19 to 23 is the ultimate you had to be there moment. The problem is there is one who wasn't there. And that's what leads to number two, and you probably know who I'm talking about when we start in verse 24. We consider the doubting disciple. Now again, when uh, one disciple in particular, one of the original 12, comes into focus in his name. Can you tell me who his name is? Thomas, Thomas, poor guy, poor doubting Thomas. Uh, and, and, and Thomas really is known uh, for just, if, if you're just unfamiliar with, with the Bible, he's, uh, this disciple is pretty much known for one thing, doubting the news about the resurrection. That's what he's known for. And he wears that, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe the Lord will correct it in heaven and it'll just be wiped from our memories and we'll just celebrate Thomas. I think by the time we get to the end of this passage, we're going to have great reason to celebrate doubting Thomas because he's really going to help us, and he's going to give us great assurance about what we be believe about Jesus here. But that's what he's known for. Now, verse 24 sets up the situation. It says, now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side... I will never believe. Thomas gets a bad rap. Where was Thomas when Jesus first appeared? We don't know. Could it be that he was just not there and so he's having trouble understanding? Would any of the other disciples or any of us have fared any better if we would have heard the news that the man who died is now back from the dead and he's not back from the dead as a metaphor? He's not back from the dead subjectively as their hearts rise up in hopes to him. He's alive like actually, like I talk to him. He knew my name. He has a voice. He has vocal cords. Like, <laughs> he, and, and, he can, and he can appear and reappear at will. I mean, like, like I saw him. Well, I mean, you know, what's Thomas thinking? I mean, would they have done any better? Would I have done any better? Again, all of the gospel writers make the point. They all stumbled through all of this. They're all just picking themselves up. And John, Peter, James, and John go back to fishing before Jesus ascends to heaven. Why do they go back to fishing? Well, that's what they did before. That's all they know. They gave up everything. They didn't have another, they, they didn't have a fallback plan after following Jesus. They just said, well, I guess I'll go get my boat. 
But Thomas is a man of courage and conviction. This is the man who in chapter 11, after Jesus proposes to go to Galilee to raise Lazarus, says to the other disciples, let us go with him that we may die with him. And maybe you see something of Thomas in yourself. Thomas needs evidence. Thomas is firm. I got to see it to believe it. That's, that's what he says, right? That's, that, that is verse 25. That's the interpretation. I got to see him to believe him. That's verse 25. Maybe you are a just naturally skeptical person. You're curious, slow to believe the first thing you hear. And let me just say, I don't think, I don't, I, that's not altogether bad, okay? That's, it's not altogether bad. There's a lot of wisdom in that, a lot of reasonableness in that. The book of Proverbs condones the simple, it's, it just rejects the simple man who believes, who believes news the first time he hears it, right? Uh, Proverbs says, everyone seems right, everyone who talks first seems right until they're examined a second time. Okay, so don't be naive, don't be gullible. So, so Thomas, Thomas gets a bad rap. He doesn't want to be naive, he doesn't want to be gullible. And it's really easy to find ourselves being that simple person or to find ourselves being the kind of person who is so obstinate that we don't have the nimbleness mentally and emotionally to change when we ought to. And so the question is this, if, 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 and I think we've all got a little bit of that, but if you're really oriented that way, if in Thomas you see something of yourself, let me just say, however, if when presented evidence, are you willing to change your mind? Curiosity's great. Skepticism's okay. I think it's also okay to doubt your doubts on just about anything and go and search it out. That is the question for Thomas. When presented with evidence, what will he do? His demand is clear in verse 25. Now, what does Thomas want in verse 25? I think it's very obvious. He wants to know that this is Jesus and not somebody else. He wants to know that it's Jesus and not someone else. I don't, I don't, that's why he says, that's why he says his, he does not want to be mistaken about who this is. Okay, so if you say it's Jesus, I got to know it's Jesus. I got to see his hands. I got to see his side. He's got to look me in the eye. I've got to know it's him. He also wants to know that it is Jesus physically and not spiritually or metaphorically. He wants to know that they did not see Jesus rise in their hearts, but that they saw him with their eyes. Because he knows, I, I think Thomas understands that if that physical man was physically hung on a cross, buried, wrapped up, left the grave clothes behind, and you can shake his hand, now we're talking. Now we're talking. Now the one crucified at Calvary truly is, I mean, I mean he truly, he, he defeated death and didn't lose anything. He just gained stuff. Yeah, he rose I, subjectively somehow. This is what liberal theologians taught for hundreds of years, that Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead. How can you actually believe that he physically rose from the dead? That's the linchpin. That's the key. And that is what Thomas is demanding. And I'm so grateful that he does because what happens next, friends, is perhaps one of the most important interactions in history. I mean that, and I think you'll believe the same thing. Let's consider third, the proof for belief. The proof for belief. What to notice in verse 26 is that we've sped ahead. Verse 26 starts eight days later, so we're a week, so, so we've got some gap in time here. It says his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Verse 26, excuse me, verse 26. So what we are to notice is that verses 26 and verses 19 are virtually identical. Look again at verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now again, verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. It's identical except Thomas is there. Doors are still locked. They're still afraid. Again, they stumble their way through these 40 days. And then Pentecost comes, and they're men that are like, they're like, kill me for Jesus. T truly, that's what these men become. They're, the resurrection changed everything for them. If he really did come back from the dead, and it's not a lie, I can give, I mean, who gives their life, who gives their life for, a, I mean, who gives their life for a lie? It's because it's not a lie. So they all, they all give their lives for it. It just transforms everything. The disciples are together and the doors are locked and Jesus miraculously, mysteriously, but physically appears again. Verse 26, 
And he says the same thing, peace be with you. Now, let's try to picture this in our minds, okay? So, the disciples are together. We don't know how many. We can assume it's the, we can assume it's the, lev- the 11. Judas is dead. Thomas is there, so there's 11, probably with some others. So, the original 11 minus Judas plus some others. There's hushed talks. That, I, to me, they're still in a state of, man, like, are we, what's, how, how safe are we? Jesus shows up and there's, oh, damn, I don't know how, I, and, and, and you know, I mean, like, Jesus has their attention. Like, I can't imagine that Jesus materializes again and someone says, hey, there's Jesus. What were you saying? You know, I mean, so I can imagine a circle forms and in, and in verses 26 to 29, John zeroes in on Thomas because Jesus zeroes in on Thomas. Look at verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. So Jesus goes like this. Okay? And put out your hand and stick it in my side. Okay, now let's stop. You don't do this to a ghost. You get, are we getting this? You don't do this to a spirit. You don't touch scars on a spirit. You touch scars on a living, breathing person with a body. That's the key. That's the key. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Notice another parallel, not just the situation, but the actual demand. Look, at, look back again at verse 25. So the other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see his hand, in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my, fa- my hand into his side, I will never believe. Verse 27, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe and keep on believing. Jesus meets Thomas at every single demand. Again, the situation, behold the grace of the king of glory. It, it, the situation is not, get over here, Thomas. The situation is, Thomas, what do you need? What would you like to see? What evidence do you require? Place it here. Now, and in probably one of the most Christ-centered confessions given in the Bible, verse 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. What else do you, what else do you say? After everything this man has said, look, look, God, if, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you have to accept everything he said. I, <laughs> He rose from the dead, but I don't like any of that stuff that he taught. If he rose from the dead, then he gets to say only true things all the time that must be believed. Interestingly, it doesn't say if Thomas took him up on the offer. He just erupts in worship. It doesn't say, and Thomas shook his hand and stuck his hand. Yeah, that's that's flesh. That's resurrected flesh forever. It's not what he does. He says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't say, don't call me that. He accepts it because that's who he is. He's the Lord. He didn't say, shh. (laughs) This man just dunked all over death by coming up through it through the resurrection. You bet he's Lord and God. This is the, what did he say? It's becoming my favorite verse in John. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down and I take it up again. Here he is. Here he is. He did it. He did it. Thomas, I did it. And forever you'll see these scars to behold the Lamb of God who is the Lion of Judah. That's what's happening here. Now what's interesting is that after John zeroes in on Thomas, because Jesus does, John zeroes in on you and me. We're in this passage, all of us who are trusting in Jesus. Look at verse 29. Verse 29. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now that phrase, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, that's a beatitude. Like in Matthew, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's a statement of favor. Jesus says to everybody who comes after Thomas, who isn't able to see what he's able to see, blessed are you for not seeing and still believing. Now that that matters, because that's... uh, That's everybody after Thomas, like everybody in this room presently trusting in Christ. Blessed are you. You haven't, you have not had the privilege of Thomas and yet you believe. That's blessed. That's blessed. Your faith is not inferior. One author said it like this, Jesus here casts his shadow forward down the meadows of history, envisioning the countless millions who will trust him without ever having seen him in the flesh, without ever having traced out the scars on his hands, his feet, and his side. 
their faith is not inferior. Indeed, in the particular providence of God, the report of Thomas' experience is one of the things the Spirit of God will use to bring them to faith. Jesus graciously provides the visual and tangible evidence to the one so that the written report of Thomas' faith and confession will spur to conversion those who only have access to the text. Both Thomas and his successors believe in Jesus and have life in his name. Peter describes, okay, so look, look, this room is filled with people that, look, look, you have staked eternal glory and blessing on someone you've never seen, and you are not inferior for doing so. Peter describes the Christian experience like this. I would love it if you would just mark this down. It won't be on the screens. I apologize for that. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. You can, you're welcome to turn there or just write it down and read it later. First Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Here's the Christian experience. Ready? I want you to listen. Peter writes, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Have you ever seen Jesus? Do you love him? Yes. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Let's consider finally, number friends, as we bring this message to a close, let's consider number four, the purpose for it all. What's the purpose for it all? John stops his story, his narrative in verses 30 and 31, and gives us the purpose statement for which he's written. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Oh, the things that Jesus did, right? But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John, so we could simply ask this question, why, why the gospel according to John? Why here this morning? Why, why these number of sermons? Why, why, why all the things that Jesus did, all the claims that he made? Why? Why do we have these things? Well, it's, it, it, if we push in, press into this idea of purpose, it's very clear that Jesus, that God gave us breath for another day, friends, so that God's word could say to each of us this morning, believe and keep on believing. That's what the phrase, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, verse 31, and that by believing, that's present progressive. So that's believe and keep on believing. That's a, that's a, that's a finished action with a continuing result. You believe once and you keep on doing it. You don't get re-saved, but you continue just in the way you started. In dependence upon Jesus, always until he's finished with you. That's the Christian life. You haven't seen him, but you love him. You're filled with hope for him, and you keep on going. You persevere. The mark of faith. So we believe, yes, and perhaps this is, and so there's two things, two themes we could pick up here. One is to believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Reject all of the ways you believe through bad things you have disqualified yourself from a relationship with God because you haven't and trust in the resurrected Jesus. And perhaps this morning, reject all the good things you've done that you believe qualify you before, with a, for a relationship with God because they don't and trust in the resurrected Christ. Those are both lies. You haven't done enough good things to merit it and you haven't done enough bad things to disqualify yourself. He's ready for whoever it is, the person who thinks they're not sinful enough for him and the person who thinks they're too sinful for him. That's the first call, believe in Jesus. And to say, keep on believing. Rely and keep on relying. Believe, keep on believing. Trust and don't stop trusting. Reject, my friends. May we reject any idea that saving faith in Jesus is a trend, a fad, a, 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 a just one job we have, or some kind of means to another end. Please, we must believe that believing in Jesus is nothing other than a complete renovation of our lives that lasts for as long as our lives last. That's what saving faith is. That nothing else will do. You... you don't, don't, what, are, what are we doing now to make sure I'm still faithful to Jesus 10 years from now? That's how a Christian talks. Or five minutes from now. We, we rely on him moment by moment in this lifelong perseverance. But I would ask as we end, perseverance to what end? What are we waiting for? What's our goal? Where are we headed? The answer is we are waiting for sight. 
That's a theme in this passage, by the way, sight. Two things, believe and sight. Thomas didn't see him. All the other ones did. Jesus said, look. He looks. They shows himself. See, see, see things. See things. This passage is very concrete, okay? We have recordings of people seeing things. And there, here's this whole room filled with people that stake their entire eternity on, on something they've never seen. Something you've never seen. But what we learn is that one day, friends, our faith will be sight. The Bible teaches that one day, Thomas's experience will be our experience. We will see Jesus. Like, 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 with, like, like, he's, you don't see a ghost, you don't see, you'll see him. Isn't that exhilarating? Isn't that a very simple thought to take very seriously? That John says, you shall see him, and when you see him, you'll be like him. Do you want anything else? Not really, like I have to eat, but besides that, could we just hasten the day, please? I mean, we've been, we've been saying we love him for our entire lives, and then we're going to finally get to see him forever, and he's not going to go anywhere. One day our faith will be sight, and that's good news because the resurrected Christ, excuse me, the crucified Christ is the resurrected Christ, and we need to finish that statement. The resurrected Christ is the one who will resurrect all of his own. You see, friends, the guarantee that you and I have a resurrection that is embodied, that isn't some ethereal, this is a whole other subject, but that it's physical, that it's real, that it's everything we've been promised it is, is the fact that this man said, touch my hands. So all the sight we have right now to see Jesus, it is necessary, it is sufficient, and it's temporary. And one day, this idea of the resurrection one day will happen. And this is why we can look at our chronic illnesses, our pains, our aches, our confusions, our anxieties, our conflicts, and say to ourselves or to them, whoever it is, one day you'll be healed of this. Like, I, 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 do, not, I do not know if you'll be cured of this in this life, but you will be in the next. Isn't it, isn't, I mean, isn't this why like, pastors are called on to do funerals? You won't hear this from anybody else. This is why, for a long time, churches used to put cemeteries out on their backgrounds, because we believe something about death and resurrection. It doesn't endow any privilege. It's just trying to say, this doesn't scare us. We're not freaked out by this. Bring it on. One day, our faith will be sighted. And friends, please know, please know that on the basis of the appearances of Jesus, you are not, I am not, you will not, I will not suffer from anything that a good resurrection from the dead cannot fix. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, in this hope, we want to live and we want to die whenever that is. We want our loved ones to live and die in this, our coworkers to live and die in this, our family and friends to live and die in this. In this hope you were saved, Paul says, the hope of the glory of God. And so, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be encouraged and helped by this truth. I pray that you would take your word, plant it deep within us, and out of us would come resurrection hope, that we would do this very simple idea in order to be equipped to follow you, to take this very simple but encouraging idea, Jesus is alive from the dead, and take it very seriously. And, 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 and lift up that shield of faith against the flaming darts of the evil one, the evil one of doubt, the evil one of envy and of greed and of cynicism and of fear and of, and of nothing's ever going to improve and of I'm never going to get out of this. We lift up the shield of faith with Christ defeated death. He dunked all over our greatest enemy. I have nothing to fear. In Christ alone, our hope is found. All other ground is sinking sand, Lord. No guilt in life, no fear in death. Would you give it to us in this new year and every year after? We pray these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. Amen, friends.